Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of What the Field. I'm Emmeline. And I am Roman. Today we are joined by a guest from very, very far away. Uh, we've got with us uh, Kim, uh, who's joining us from the island of Granada in the Caribbean and from his farm, Crayfish Bay Organics. Kim, thank you so much for being with us today. It's an absolute pleasure to have you. No, thank you very much for the invitation. So, so in today's episode, we want to talk about not only your very fascinating story, but also about chocolate production in general, which is quite a, which is quite a controversial industry, um, the world of chocolate, actually. So, yeah, let's hope to shed some light on the topic. Tell us a bit about you, Kim. How did you end up in Granada um, and how did you start producing chocolate? Uh, well, I kind of arrived here by accident 30 years ago. Uh, I was working on boats and stuff. And um, then in 2006, um, I found this very rundown cocoa estate, um, which had been hit by hurricanes a couple of times. It had been abandoned for about 50 years. Um, I knew nothing about cocoa at all. I didn't even know that cocoa grew on trees. Um, <laughs> but I decided it was a very, very beautiful place. And uh, uh, I managed to scrape enough money together to buy it and um, started clearing the cocoa and uh, finding these very old stunted trees underneath the, um, the vine and all the other trees that were growing um, and started actually producing cocoa beans on a very small scale. Um, I got certified as organic, um, which is something I seriously believe in. It's, um, and um, then realized that you cannot make a living from cocoa bean. Um, there just isn't enough money in it. I mean, most raw materials um, for the West, and when I say the West, I include China and Russia, I'm talking about industrial nations, mm -hmm. come from the third world. Um, and the corporates who buy them, um, know that there's no alternative work for the people in the third world countries. And so they can get away with paying an absolute pittance for the raw materials. And cocoa farmers worldwide are some of the poorest farmers in the world. Um, here in Grenada, we, we, you, you can't survive from cocoa bean. Um, you can't even think about buying a pair of decent shoes or a new phone. Uh, things which people take for granted in the West. Mm -hmm. um, so I realized we couldn't survive from um, just selling cocoa bean. Um, we decided to um, enhance the product. So for two years, we produced nibs. Um, and then after two years, we started making chocolate on a very, very small scale. I mean, the sort of scale that you would do in your own kitchen at home. <laughs> very, very tiny. And that was about five and a half, six years ago. And since then, we've slowly developed. And we now have, it's still a very small factory, but I don't want to get bigger because I don't want to um, start getting into the sort of corporate mentality. Uh, mm -hmm. So we're, we're a family farm. Um, the people who work with us, as opposed to for us, yeah. um, they're all from our local village. Uh, we're very community based with various things that we do, like I'll explain later. But worldwide, the, the cocoa situation is desperate for the farmers that grow it. Um, we've managed to get to a point where we can produce chocolate. Um, but even by producing chocolate, it's very, very difficult to export and, and get into the world market because we are fighting the corporates. And the corporates have billions of dollars and we have cents. And it's organizations like crowd farming that are saving us. I mean, in last year, with co the way that COVID affected the island, we, we lost 90% of our income. And it was um, crowdfunding that actually saved us totally, absolutely, without question. Um, it doesn't have to be, the, the farmers worldwide aren't strong enough to fight the corporates. Um, the people that can help change the situation are organizations like yourselves, the general public having an awareness of um, the, the, the 
the suffering and the damage that they're encouraging when they buy corporate products. Mm. For example, in West Africa, um, a lot of children from Mali are literally enslaved on the cocoa plantations in Sierra Leone, Ghana, West Coast. Um, they don't escape slavery until they're about 16 or 17. They're usually enslaved when they're between seven and nine years old. Um, and they suffer all the indignities, especially the girls, obviously, of yeah. slavery. Um, now, companies like Hershey's, Cadbury's, even the so-called respectable ones like Lint and a lot of the Belgian makers, they are buying their beans from West Africa. 80% of the beans used in the world come from West Africa. Especially from Ghana and the Ivory Coast, no? Sierra Leone. In Sierra Leone. It's important that the awareness comes to the public mm -hmm. so that when they buy a bar of chocolate um, or a T-shirt, <laughs> They, yeah. they actually understand how it's been produced and in many cases how people are suffering um, to produce something so that the corporates in the West can make humongous profits. Yeah. Um, and uh, then, th then thirdly, there's, there's people like ourselves, that, small farmers, uh, that have set up um, a way of enhancing our product. Um, because for small farmers to do what I'm doing, um, we have to have a market. Um, even selling organic beans is difficult um, because there isn't a huge market for organic beans. Um, and a lot of the brokers aren't willing to pay the price. Yeah. And if the brokers don't pay the price, then the farmer doesn't get the price, then the farm workers get very bad wages and poverty continues. It's kind of the same for all types of crops in this I, way. I, I, I actually believe it's the responsibility, the responsibility of the rich and the, edu and the educated to look after the poor and the uneducated. It doesn't mean that we give them charity. It means we enhance their lives and maybe don't live quite so rich ourselves. Yep. And I believe that's our responsibility as a, as a, as a species. And it's actually very interesting what you've done at, at Crayfish Bay Organics because you started producing the beans and now you're producing chocolate. So you're actually producing high added value products within your farm closer to the farmers, right? So that creates an additional source of income for the farmers. Is that right? Yeah. Um, I mean, the... How can I... I have to explain this carefully. Um, the people who work my land, who look after the cocoa, I don't pay them a wage. I pay them no wage at all. What I've done is I've given them absolute 100% control of my land. And everything that comes off the land belongs to them, including the cocoa bean. Mm -hmm. So I buy my own cocoa beans at absolutely top price. Mm -hmm. And this has had a huge impact on them, a positive impact, not just financially, but also many other reasons, self-esteem, um, an understanding of um, quality farming, all sorts of things. Um, and so, yeah, it's had a massive effect on people. Um Remember, I, you, I don't take beans from other farms. I only use my own beans. Yeah? So um, for other farmers to um, have a similar result, they would have to do a similar thing. Um, it, and it doesn't have to be chocolate. I mean, we, farmers could produce um, cocoa butter and powder. They could produce soaps. They could produce nibs uh, for export. And they could produce... Um, liquors, uh, both alcoholic and non-alcoholic. All these things can be made in the third world um, on a small scale. It's not going to work if we bring big industry in, um, but on a small scale, it works very, very well. Um, the same way as probably many farms years ago in Spain, I know in Switzerland because I live there, um, they produce their own cheese from their own cows and so forth. Farming works really well on a small scale. 
Um, when you start getting huge corporate farms, it, it, it doesn't work. It works for the, 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 the corporates that own the farms, but it doesn't work for the land and it doesn't work for the people who work the land. Mm -hmm. Do you think that this implies uh, for the people, for the consumers, to maybe lower their consumption? Because if we produce on a smaller scale, then it would mean we produce a little less. So would it help if people maybe instead of buying lots of chocolate all the time, um, they bought less, but then of quality, for example? Uh, ah, yeah, that's, uh, that's a huge question. <laughs> uh, all, I think that people should reduce their consumption of everything because, yeah, because we're destroying the planet through our consumption. Hmm. Um, Very true. So that's one, you know, you, this question can be answered on different levels. Um, you know, if we want to support the farmers and support the poor, then the, the, re the, the, the retail customer is going to probably continue um, buying good quality chocolate. What I would recommend that is he continues buying lots of good quality chocolate and stops buying, well, the only way I can say it is, is crap, um, yeah. which is all your sugars and and added chemicals and stuff that people are eating these days, you know. Um, uh, there's no reason um, all food shouldn't be of a good quality. The only reason food is of a bad quality is because the producers are greedy for money. Mm -hmm. if, if you cut out the greed, you end up with quality because people take pride in this stuff. You can't take pride in something that's got 500 different chemicals in it. Mm. it, it you know, it's a huge question. We have a, it's a psychological question. It covers many aspects of the, the human species and the way we operate. Yeah. And Kim, speaking of pride, we know you take a lot of pride in the fact your, your, your farm is organic. What made you take that step? Well, huh. I actually went to agricultural college many, many years ago, hmm. Hmm. and uh, I had to write a thesis. Mm -hmm. And my thesis, the title of my thesis, was weed and pest control using organic methods. And um, we had to hand in the gist of our thesis during the first three or four months of our three-year college course. So I handed in the title and the gist. And the college gave it back to me and said, this subject is not appropriate in modern agriculture. Um, and I wouldn't take that for an answer. So mm -hmm. I basically said, forget college, go and live organically. Yeah. And, and it's and so been working out. So you, you are not suffering from, I don't know, maybe lo lower production or anything because you're not using pesticides, herbicides, all of that to oh, fight a plague? My, 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 my productions are very good. Um, I can't give you the figures offhand. I, I get a, a little bit less than a conventional farm. Um, but um, because the price of organic beans or chocolate is, is higher or slightly higher mm -hmm. than conventional, uh, financially, it works out the same. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know... We're not destroying the being, planet. Being organic, being organic, I mean, uh, in some ways, I'm lazy. <laughs> How is that? Well, I, I, you know, if, 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 I have to, uh, if I have to buy chemicals, <laughs> then I have to make the money to buy them. I have to buy spraying units. I have to get clothes to wear. Uh, when I use it, I'm damaging stuff that, and it, it's just, and by not doing it, I mean, th 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 everything's happy, everything's good, <laughs> everything's in balance, you know, and to be in balance is easy, and that's lazy, being in balance, it's great, you know, if you're gotcha. out of balance, then it's hard work, yeah. <laughs> gotcha. Emily, I don't know if you have any other questions for, for Kim. Uh, I do, I do. Actually, we were wondering, well, I asked Roman if he knew what the expression tree to bar means. 
and he actually no didn't idea. and i only know it because i took a sneak peek at your at your website so um you talk about bean to bar tree to bar would you care to explain maybe what it actually means yeah um uh, let's start with bean to bar um bean to bar is where a chocolate maker in spain for example um he buys beans uh, either from a farmer or from a broker He takes those beans back to his little factory and he roasts them and he makes chocolate from them. That is bean to bar production. Tree to bar is going one step further back. It's where um, the easiest way to describe it is uh, a vineyard produced wine where the The farmer, the, 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 the grape grower, he grows his grapes, he picks his grapes, he ferments his grapes, and he bottles the wine. It all happens on the one farm. There's no grapes imported. Everything mm -hmm. is from the one farm. And tree, that's what tree-to-bar chocolate is. Single source. Sorry, I should have added that. Single source tree-to-bar. Mm -hmm. um, there is another type of tree-to-bar where... Um, several farms get together and they put their beans together. But this Crayfish Bay is single source. All of our beans come from Crayfish Bay Estate, nowhere else. Um, so it's a single source tree to bar production method. So from the tree to the final part bar of chocolate, which you get in Spain and Europe, Germany, um, the, those beans have never left the farm. The whole process has been here. And that's tree to bar production. Brilliant. Well, I think that's incredibly enlightening uh, for us. Um, Would you like to know the advantages of tree to bar production? I'd love to, actually. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's, let's talk about beans to start with. Um, almost all the beans in the world, commercial beans, um, are a tr type of bean called Trinitario. Um, all of the beans cocoa grown in Grenada is Trinitario. Now, Trinitario is a crossbreed between Forestario and Criolla. It was developed in the 1800s in Trinidad, hence the name Trinitario. It, it's not a hybrid, and this means that the beans are fertile. Um, what it does mean, however, that is Trinit not all Trinitario is the same. Some Trinitario can lean towards Criolla, and some Trinitario can lead towards Forestario. Now, Criolla is the smaller pod. It's not sought after commercially particularly. There's small beans and a small pod. But for artisan chocolate, which is what we're making, where we're searching for flavors, um, as opposed to Cadbury's who want their chocolate to taste the same every time you buy it, we are actually looking for differences in flavors. Criolla for us is wonderful because that's where the flavors are coming from. Now, we want Criolla, but how do you propagate? If I take the seeds from a Trinitario and plant them, I have no idea what I'm going to get, whether it's going to lean towards Forestario or lean towards Criolla. It can go either way. So we have ways of propagation by forcing the trees to grow suckers at the bottom. And after it, we do this to old trees that are on there in their last couple of years. And we let those suckers grow for about two years. And then we look for the one with the best shape. We leave that one, cut the others out. And um, then the new sucker will actually grow into a new tree. The beauty of that system is we have good rootstock and we know exactly what type of bean we're going to get. And so with this tree to bar system, we can actually control the, 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 the beans that we're getting. Um, and over a period of years, you can form balances between Criolla type and forest stereotype and all sorts of things. If you're, that's a single source. If you're getting beans from all over the place, from different farms, you can't do that. You don't really know what you're getting. So it gives you a lot of control over um, your final product. Yeah? Over the flavor. Yeah, or flavors we're looking for. There's flavor, a yeah. flavor in chocolate. 
Um, yeah, with Tree to Bar, you, you have such great control. Um, and on a small scale like this, with only four or five people working at it, you're all watching everything. And it, it, I mean, at the moment, we've got beans fermenting outside. Um, and we checked the, the acid levels of those this morning. Um, mm -hmm. And they're getting very close to perfect fermentation. So, so chocolate, start, sorry to interrupt. So chocolate is actually made with fermented beans? I didn't know. I thought there, it was made with, with basically dried beans. The, the first, the beans are picked off the trees. Yeah. Um, the, sorry, the pods. Um, the pods are picked off the trees and then they're cracked open with a machete. And inside you've got beans, white beans, covered in slime. Right? That's what they're like. Now... That slime is highly acidic. It's also the most beautiful flavors in the world. It's like having every Caribbean fruit in your mouth at the same time. That applies to here in Grenada, because I've sucked on Trinitario beans in other parts of the world, and they taste completely different, although they're the same treat. Um, those beans, when they're in that form, when they're wet and covered in slime, we call them wet beans. And we put them in wooden boxes and we ferment them for about five days. We don't add anything. It's a natural fermentation. It's the least known about and the least spoken about. It's a dirty, stinking job. There's nothing nice about fermentation. But for making artisan chocolate, it is by far the most important part of the process. Kim, you have a platform here. Is there anything you'd like to add to tell to your consumers in Europe that buy your chocolate through Croat Farming? Yeah, there is. Um, my belief in organic goes way beyond chocolate. It goes way beyond food. Um, I believe that the planet is one living orgasm. Organism, sorry. <laughs> Either way, it works. Um, uh, and we are all part of it. Everything. The stones, the boulders, the dirt, the mosquitoes, the human beings, the compost heap. It's all one living thing. And we have to try and look after it. Mm -hmm. I know we have to destroy things for our own needs. That's common throughout the whole world kingdom. Animals kill others to eat. Um, we have to look after each other, that means, as well. Not just look after the planet itself, try and avoid pollution, so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, we have to learn to think in terms of what we need rather than what we want and try and get a balance. It, it's all about balance. Mm -hmm. Now, part of the ingredients in our chocolate. Um, if you read the ingredients on the back, I haven't got a packet here with me, but it says 75% um, um, cocoa solids, 25% organic sugar, lots of love and hard work. <laughs> Those are the ingredients, yeah. Um, love is all about looking after things. And the way we've set our, our factory up It supports the local economy. Our village is a very poor village. Um, and by the way, we've set it up by giving these guys control of the land, um, by using a charcoal burner. I'll come to that in a moment. Um, uh, it's had a huge impact on people in the village. So when you buy our chocolate, yes, you are supporting the wife and I and our little company, but more importantly, you're supporting up to 20 or 30 people that live in this village indirectly, not just through chocolate, but also a lot of like last year, as, as um, it was 2020, um, we grow a lot of bananas in our lands, um, which, as I say, belong to the farmers. And they sell some and they give some away. And it's good for me because when they cut them down, the potassium goes into the land. It's good for the cocoa. But in 2020, they were, they were just giving them away. And, and bananas 
are an essential part of the diet here. It's not like the yellow ones you eat in Europe. They're, yeah. they're, they're boiled, they're fried, they're cooked in all sorts of different ways. And it's a staple part of the diet. And 2020, this country lost 90% of its income. Work was scarce, money was zero. There's no social welfare system. People were getting hungry. And those bananas were looking after half of our village. So by supporting Crayfish Bay, you're supporting a much bigger thing. And, and this is why it's, I, I, I hope you buy our chocolate. It's not cheap. <laughs> um, but the profits, if you take away thinking about money, the profits are just enormous for everybody and for yourself even because of that connection between us all. Um, going back to charcoal, I, I like to talk about this. Um, the industry here in Grenada, the cocoa industry is dying. Um, it's dying because the price that a farmer gets for his cocoa bean uh, per ton or per pound, however they're selling it, is simply not enough to live on. And I can't emphasize that enough. It is not enough to live on. Um, it's very, very hard work. The price is obviously controlled by the corporates. Now, young people will not look at cocoa. And I don't blame them because if I was a young Grenadian and I was getting offered something like five euros a day to pick cocoa, I, I, don't, I don't know if I got that conversion right. Don't take it literally, but it's a very small figure. I wouldn't look at cocoa because I want to have a computer and I want to have a phone and I want to have all the things that other people have. Um, so the only people farming cocoa now are the old. And the average age this year of a cocoa farmer is 69. Next year, it will be 70. And in 20 years, we will be dead. We can't avoid it. Um, what's going to happen then is the corporates will move in. They'll lease the land, buy the land, steal the land. They'll set up factories here for processing quivachar or chocolate or whatever. They'll employ people at a minimum wage. And it will be economic slavery, as it is in many parts of the world today. And I'm trying to show people on a small scale how we can avoid that. And so I've set up a tiny factory to produce chocolate. That's the beginning of the story. Now, we were quoted a quarter of a million US dollars to set this factory up. A quarter of a million. There's 250,000 US dollars. Hmm. I had around about 700 US dollars in my bank account. And that is more than most farmers have in their banks. So how do I build a chocolate factory? First of all, I could go and borrow money. From a bank. I tell everyone I meet, everyone, especially young people, never Never, never borrow money, ever. You are putting yourself into a slave trap. And that applies to you in Spain and everywhere else. As soon as you borrow money, the bank has you by the short and curlies. <laughs> um, so how did I do it? I did it by building machinery from garbage on the island. And it cost me... About a thousand US dollars, a bit more than I had in my bank. I did some work on a building site, got some more money. It cost me about a thousand dollars to set up a roaster and a winnowing machine. And with those two machines, I could produce nibs, which increased the value of my cocoa beans by about 500%. I think I might be wrong on that figure, but it certainly gave me a lot more anyway. <laughs> so we exported those for two years. And then we bought our first tiny chocolate machine for 100 US. And we took about five years over it. And eventually we got a chocolate factory without borrowing money. So that's the first thing I'm trying to teach the young. You can do it that way. Yeah? Now, the charcoal, we built the roaster. Um, I got the idea from a photograph of... Uh, four South American guys who just had an oil drum with holes banged in it and a wood fire underneath and a handle on the end, you know, as opposed to the huge stainless steel 
thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollar machines. So I built something similar. I, I couldn't use steel. I had to use stainless for the drum and I, I couldn't use um, wood underneath because too many smells and, and things. You know. um, so I built the roaster and then I had to work out what I was going to use for a heat source. Well, 90% of roasters in the world or more are heated by gas, diesel, or electricity. Now, whenever I buy any of those things, I'm supporting the corporates who already have too much money and finance wars and things. I wouldn't be supporting my community at all. So I thought, what else have we got? And I came up with the idea of charcoal. And I spoke to charcoal makers around the world. Uh, sorry, chocolate makers. And um, they all said, it's a great idea, Kim, but it won't work. And I said, well, what happened when you tried? And mm -hmm. they all said the same thing. We didn't try. It won't work. <laughs> yeah. So I tried charcoal and it works perfectly. The people... And this is so important. This is part of the ethos of our chocolate. Um, the people who make charcoal are the poorest people in the communities. You, you wouldn't believe how poor they are, some of them, yeah? Um, and they're living on nothing. Um, and normally when they sell charcoal, they sell a tiny bucket of it for about, um, it's about four... Is it four? Yeah, about four US dollars, which is about four euros. Yeah. Yeah. Um, roughly. They're, they're lucky if they sell one of those a day. Mm. And they have to get it downtown on a bus. No bus wants to carry charcoal. It, it really is the bottom end. Yeah. And I go to them and I go along with around about, uh, I'll try and do it in euros, um, 2000 EC in euros. 2,800, uh, about, about 800 yeah. euros, which is very different to four. Mm. Um, and I buy 800 or 1,000 euros dollars worth of charcoal from them. And for them, it's like winning the lottery. Yeah. They can fix their roof. They can get glasses for their children. They can pay the bus fare. It makes such it has such a huge impact on their life, and and again, this this is why people should buy from makers like ourselves, whether it's chocolate or beans or whatever it is. But people who are supporting other people that this organic way, and, and I think it's very clear. It's it goes beyond what is organic, but you're influencing the whole community, your whole neighbours. Your, your friends, perhaps, as well, that, that live close to you, can also benefit from, from this trade, right? So giving back to the community. It, it's it's my, my version of fair trade. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly is. Not everybody gets the same size piece of cake, but everybody gets enough cake. That's the important thing, yeah? Mm. Yeah. Uh, at the moment, there's too many people in the world that are not getting enough. And the, yeah, the that's sadly very true. Off is because of the greed of the corporate industries. Mm. Yeah. Well, Kim, thank you very much. I think um, time-wise, we unfortunately need to, <laughs> to wrap up. come to an end yeah. here. Um, is there anything else you'd like to share with us? Yeah, I'd just like to add to all of the people watching this in the future. It might be six of you. It might be 60 million. I have no idea. Um, but all of you, not at the same time, I must add, all of you are welcome to visit here. We've got cottages you can stay in and uh, you can really get a feel for Grenada, meet the people. And you can even help on the estate and you can see how much backbreaking work actually goes into that bar of chocolate that you're having on a Friday evening. You know. um, and thank you very much. And thank you for crowdfunding. And thank you for those people that have bought chocolate through crowdfunding and potentially are going to buy it through crowdfunding. <laughs> <laughs>
Thanks a lot, Kim. Yes, we will certainly come and visit you. I think you totally I, convinced I hope us. So. We need the budget. <laughs> <laughs> Convince our boss to send us over there. Yes. Um, but Kim, we're, we're incredibly grateful for your time. Uh, we know you're very busy. Well, you it's do. been a real pleasure. Pleasure is ours, Kim. Pleasure Thanks ours. again. Catch you later. Thank you for listening in to yet another episode of What the Field. We hope you enjoyed this little field trip into the world of Kim and his Crayfish Bay Organics cocoa production. And yes, hope to hear you soon. Yeah, to see you at the next episode. Thanks a lot for joining us. Bye. Bye.